Welcome back. Um, we're now going to do the lab for chapter 11, the survival um, analysis uh, chapter. And we have three data sets we're going to look at. And the first one is the brain cancer data. Rob, do you want to tell us a little bit about the brain cancer data? Well, it's a, a data set of 88 patients who suffered from brain cancer, um, looking at their survival, um, the, 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 how long they survived um, with brain cancer, and looking uh, the survival as a function of, of sex, and, all, and most importantly, the, the diagnosis category of brain cancer, as well as other, other factors. Okay, great. So these data on the ISLR2 um, in the package. And this lab, we're going to do a little differently. Instead of actually stepping through the code, we're going to take the output of the markdown, which is a nice HTML file. And this looks very similar to the, what you have in the, in the chapter in the book, except it's got the output as well shown. The plots and whatever are shown as well. And it looks really nice. So the brain cancer data is in the package, as we say, and we say names, and the other names, particular any ones particular of ones of interest here, Rob? Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, sex, looking at potential sex differences, and the diagnosis category is yeah. potential interest of um, yeah. importance. Yeah. And these others are described in the book. I believe this was Karnofsky Index, which is a mouthful. We look at the breakdown of sex and roughly balanced, right? Male and female, 45, 43. And these are the diagnostic categories, different types of, of brain cancer. And status, which is how many died. So those are the, the ones, are they wrong? That's the ones and the zeros are, are censored. Yeah. yeah. So we do make a point here that um, you, you need to check, so status one is, is death here. It's very easy to, to code status. This is the sensor invariable, the other way around, and you want to make sure you get it right, right? Um, so we know there were 35 deaths in the brain cancer data, and so status one means death. So the first thing we do is we'll plot a Kaplan-Meier survival curve, as shown in the text, and for that we use a surfit function. And it uses a formula and a particular um, incantation for the response. So there's a function serve, which takes a time and the status. So the status is, is part of the, the response, whether it's censored or not. And in this case, we, we just model it as, as, we model it as one, a constant. So we just want a marginal survival curve for all the data, okay? And so that surfit does that for you. And then you can plot it. There's a plot method. And it, by default, plots the confidence interval for the plot. I believe that's plus or minus two the, standard errors. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a default. And so there you have the Kaplan-Meier curve. And now you can... You can make, instead of putting a twiddle one on the right of the formula, you can put a, a stratifying variable. So here we put sex, which is binary, and we do it again, and we can specify colors for the, for the two sexes, and, and we can put a legend in the plot as well, and there we get it. And you can see when you stratify, the default is not to put standard errors, because the picture gets a little cluttered. But you can add them if you want, and so you can see if you can figure out how to do that by looking at the surfit function and the, and the plot method. And one of the questions we're going to ask pretty soon is, are, the, are, the, are these two different? Right? They, they look to be somewhat different around 40 months, for example, but of course there's variation here and it's a small data set, so yeah. we'll have to do a proper test. Right. So it looks like the men are doing a bit worse than, than women. Yeah. Right. So, the first thing we do is perform a log rank test to compare the survival times of males to females. And that was described in, in the text. And there's a function servedif that does that for you. And it uses the same response object created by serve. And twiddle sex tells you that you, you're doing a log rank test to test if the males are different from females. And then you print out the results. 
and it seems like it's not significant. The p-value is 0.2. And one thing to remember with sensor data is, although the sample size was 88, sounds pretty big, the actual amount of information is really more to do with the number of, of failures, right? The number of, of events, which was only half of that. So the real sample size is a lot less than 88, and that's why we're getting maybe, you know, this, although they look pretty, the curves look pretty different, the p-value is not significant. Right, okay. It says here p-value is 0.23. It seems to have got truncated here. Yeah. Okay. So next we're going to fit a, a Cox proportional hazards model using the Cox pH function. We'll start off by fitting using just sex as the only predictor. Notice we're using the same formula in several incantations here, but here we're calling Cox pH. And we fit the model and we do a summary of the fit. And this gives a little bit more detailed summary. And so if you recall, this is fitting a model, a linear model, where the, the um, modification of the baseline hazard is, in this case, just a single e to a single parameter, which is, um, is the binary indicator of sex. And it comes up with a p-value of also 0.2. So is that exactly the same as the, the log rank test, Rob? Yes, it is. The score, the score test, uh, the third of those three is exactly the equivalent to the log rank test. Exactly equivalent. Right. And uh, you can see that here, yeah. And you can see that here as well. Yeah, these, I, these are rounded again. Let's scroll back up to the survival curves. Remember, the proportional hazards assumption assumes that the relative risk is constant throughout the whole study, right? And it looks like here that even that might be violated as well, right? It looks like the relative risk is pretty, the first five or ten months is pretty equal and then the females may have an advantage for for the middle period right right so of course it's hard to tell with such a small data set whether that's that's causing a problem and if it was proportional what would you expect to see we expect to see that the gap would be would start small and would it would widen as you go along i think i see so it yeah. means the ratio is constant right the relative yes the ratio yeah. is constant Okay, so where were we? So we just, yeah. We got down here and we saw... The log rank test, yeah. Yeah. And the score, and the score test equivalence. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to add some additional predictors to the model. And so we add them all in. We had sex, we add in diagnosis, and these other three variables. And now we fit the model and you get the, the, the output, when we print the output, you get something like a linear model fit accepted for, for the Cox model. So there's a coefficient for each of the variable. Diagnosis is a, a three category variable, four category variable. And so it uses one of the levels as the baseline and that's menin, meningioma is a baseline. And, and so these are all relative to that baseline, these, these numbers over here. So in, in fact, 2.4, this e to the coefficient, that's a relative risk of HG glioma relative to meningioma. So remember now, so a positive coefficient, this is getting confusing, is actually correlates with uh, shorter survival, right? Because the, the risk is higher. Whereas a negative coefficient correlates with longer survival because the risk is lower. I see. That's often confusing, but. So these, yeah. these guys, are, these categories are worse off than, than that baseline, right. right? In fact, all three of them are. Yep. So this is the this is the mild, mildest um, one, and that one's significant. This is strongly significant. There's a few more. This well, one more. This Karnofsky index Ki is also significant, and none of the others are significant. And remember, all the things we talked about for linear models and interpreting these multivariate fits still hold here as well, right? That these p-values talk are really referring to if we hold all other variables fixed, what's the, the, the predicted effect of changing that variable? I see. Right? right. So, yeah, right. So if some of these other variables are, for example, correlated, right. um, um, the, they could be showing no non-significance because the other one's standing in for it. Right. So these p-values are all what happens if you drop that variable out of the model but leave all the others in. Exactly. Yeah.
Finally, we plot the survival curves for each diagnosis category, adjusting for the other predictors. Okay, so the, the diagnostic category seems to be important, at least one of them is important. So we want to leave all the other predictors in the model. And when you plot the survival curves, you need to, the, the output of a, a Cox pH model is for each subject, when you make a prediction, you get a whole survival curve. Okay, so we need to specify what the other values of the predictors are. So when we want to focus on, on the diagnosis category, what we do is we set some typical values for the other parameters. And if they're quantitative, we'll just set the mean value. And if they're categorical, we'll set the modal value. Because we need to put some value in for all the predictors. And one of the reasons we have to do that here, right, is this model is, is really is different than a linear model where you, the fact of one variable does not depend on the, on the levels of, of the others, right? But this model is, in, in a certain way, it's sort of nonlinear, right? Uh -huh. So the, the effect of each variable actually depends on the levels of the other. Right? It, yeah. And we saw the same thing in, 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 the, in the logistic model where we, I think we saw that, or it's true in the logistic model that when you look at probabilities and the effect of a variable on, on, on the probabilities of response, it depends on the levels of the other variables, right? right. And that's the same here now. So not only will these survival curves shift up and down depending on the levels of the other variables, the values of the other variables, but the shape will change as well because it's, it's not just a, a shift, it's a, the proportional hazard thing again. It's a, the, the slope also changes. Okay, so here we have it. And sure enough, meningioma has the best survival history. The HG glioma is the worst. And that, remember, that had the highest relative risk. And then it looks like LG, glioma, and the other are very similar to each other. Yeah, yeah. They're almost completely on top of each other. Right. So that's the result. And this plot nicely separates it and, and illustrates it. 